I also season. heard that. Well, we're live. No, so. we're live, so we're not talking about murking or anything. We're not going to talk about anything. that. No. It because it, it's maple syrup time, everybody. It's... <laughs> Oh, that was a different chord. <laughs> Let's see if I can replicate it. Yeah, listen to that. That's, That's weird though. Cool. I don't I don't know. So I don't know if I like it. But anyways, maple syrup. Hey. hey. Uh it is the maple syrup show. It is nine o'clock Eastern Standard Time, where I am, I believe, where Heather is. It's also that. Yep. But for Tessa mm -hmm. and Kat are on the left coast, and they are in at six. PM, right? Yeah. It's still yeah. dark though. You're younger than <laughs> you're younger than it's us for three hours. I don't know. I don't know. Is it dark there now at six? Yeah, the sun is oh, yeah. down at four. Yeah, I would um, assume because yeah, yeah. I mean, it's getting to that time of year, right? Yeah. But it all mm -hmm. like I, I, it's funny. So I have this. Oh, Whoa. which is my my sad <laughs> lamp. Which I, uh, <laughs> it's funny. I was talking to my uh, my friend yesterday about like just um, depression. I have depression. And uh, he's like, have you turned on your lamp lately? I go, oh, no, I have not. And so I just, I started using it like yesterday uh, mm. because I have seasonal affect disorder. And yeah, set yourself a reminder on that. Because yeah. you yeah. don't realize, right? It creeps in gradually. Then you're like, why am I like this? And you go, yeah, no, that, that was literally it. Right. It was it like weeks and you go, oh, right. It was Especially like two, mm -hmm. almost like two weeks, four weeks, about that of like, I feel like poop. Mm -hmm. I just didn't do anything. Like I, I did what I had to do because if people rely on me to be somewhere, I'm there. But if nobody's relying on me to do something, I'm not doing it. <laughs> um, and then over the last couple of nights, I've been like thinking dark thoughts. And then it's like, oh, I'm depressed. That's what this is. Because it's only then that I actually realize I'm depressed. And then it's right. like, oh, I was talking to him about it. And it's like, yeah, I have not used that light lately. Maybe I should start again. Uh, yeah. Because I don't get out and about as much as uh, I used to. I don't know why, mm -hmm. but I'm just not. So I'm not out in the sun. And I guess you need sun to do things like, you know, produce vitamin D. That, yeah, that to, vitamin to D just stuff. a human, really. Probably. Yeah. So, hey, uh, today we are talking about feedback. 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 But from the, the other, other side. Of the stick. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, before we do that, let's welcome our guests. We're going to welcome Heather and Fertessa to the show. Uh, both of them Hello. have been on the show before, of course, because they're awesome. <laughs> but we also brought them back because we wanted to hear from them about how they receive feedback when they get it or how they coach other people to receive feedback because a lot of times, especially like Heather being part of Unpub and all that kind of stuff, is they're working with other designers um, and then for Tessa, when she works on teams, working with other designers. And how do you coach people to become just better at receiving this stuff that is sometimes really hard to hear? Mm -hmm. So let's start with welcomes. Welcome. Done. Hello. Okay. Let's, now let's go with origin <laughs> stories because that's what we do on this show. Uh, for Tessa, can you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself, where you are now, where you've been, what you've done. Mm -hmm. Sure. I'm very glad it wasn't like origin, the convention, but my origin story. Yeah. Great. <laughs> um, I am uh, Fritessa Lise and I'm from Atlanta. Uh, I currently live in Seattle and I uh, started game design in 2017. So I think that's six years ago. And um, after starting that, I was able to publish uh, like three games and then I started doing professionally and uh, worked as a game producer and now work as a game designer. So that's me. Excellent. Awesome. And Heather, what about you? What do you do? Uh, yeah. So um, owner of Ninth Level Games, uh, publisher of uh, RPGs and board games, and then the managing director of Unpub, as we mentioned before, uh, are kind of my two big roles. And then I also do game design uh, and game development Unfortunately, not as much as I used to because uh, I'm really busy, but <laughs> but I still do some of that too. And let's just quickly cover what Unpub is. Good call. Yeah, so Unpub is the Unpublished Games Network. And basically, it is a group for game designers uh, to either meet other people and get information, um, play test their games, pitch their games to bigger publishers to get signed, um, or basically just find out about things in the tabletop industry is kind of what our like mission is. So, yeah. 
And one of the ways that Ben puts it, which I really like, is that you can show any game as long as you're looking for feedback, which is where yeah. any unpublished, unpublished game. Right. As long as and you're honestly, looking for feedback. And I thought right. that was really relevant for today. It's a very big part of Unpub because playtesting has cut, was kind of how it started. I think it started in 2010. Uh, and that's all it was, playtesting and feedback. And then things have been added, but it's still talking about game design and playtesting and feedback and things like that. So, right, right, so right. that's um, one of the things that I wanted to cover really quickly, actually, is the difference between a demo and playtesting. And generally, you're playtesting a game that's not finished, and you're demoing a game that you consider to be finished. So um, a, a lot of people have asked me at various stages um, when I've been talking about Unpub, oh, can I demo my game? And I ask them what they mean, because sometimes they mean playtest. So, you know, just me mentioning that little thing there. That's yeah. a really good kind of distinction, I think, uh, because the feedback is going to be different, as we talked about last week, when somebody's pretty much ready to press play, uh, pr play print. Uh, we have different <laughs> levels of feedback that we're going to give people. And it's funny, we just talked about this today on one of the forums about how framing your session, whether it's a demo, whether it's a play test, really that's important it's the job of the person who is asking for the game to be play tested to do that but some people don't know that so we as more experienced designers can sometimes ask them so what kind of feedback are you looking for is this a demo or a play test and if they don't know the difference we can explain what we think the difference is and that's good enough for now um so yeah i think that is that is a really important thing to to get at is that all these things, slightly different. All right. Um, so last week when we talked about how we give feedback and Kat had a list of, you know, kindness and timeliness and, you know, are you adding to this? All these good points. What do we think on the opposite side of the reception end? How, how do we coach people to be good at receiving feedback, especially in game design? So one of the things that I wanted to just introduce, first of all, because I think all of us will do this, whether we're conscious of it or not, um, is that we set up the session so that we're setting the mood for it. And so one of the things that I try and pass on as someone who's pretty new to Unpub, honestly, um, um, I've had people who've done their very first playtesting session and they're asking me how to do it. Like, how do I be a playtester or how do I run a playtest? And I think setting it up the right way is a really important thing. And what I mean by that is explaining to the people who are going to be participating in it who you are, what your game is about, where it's up to, what you're looking for, and how you're going to run the session. So that could be that you're running a full version of a game, could be that you're just testing a particular part of it, and it could be things like, you know, how far along the game is, how far along you are. This is my very first playtest. I've never done this before. This is my very first game. I don't know what to ask you. All the way through to this game is almost finished. We're just test testing the difference between these two different card layouts. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely, uh, as we mentioned before, about with being from Unpub and hearing so many different th levels of play all the time. Um, uh, and, and Sen already said, I have it written right here, that experienced play testers will ask you, well, what type of feedback are you looking for? What's what stage is this at? And that is super important. I think you covered all that, the, the, the basics. Um, and you might not know all those answers, right? Like you might not realize what stage you're in, but you probably know if it's towards the beginning or towards the end. I think calling the <laughs> unless end it's is, your first game, <laughs> calling the end is always harder. I think, you know, when mm -hmm. you're like, I've only play tested it once or three times, but the end is, is definitely hard. Uh, but at least you could say, I've been working on this for a while and I'm working on this portion of the game. If you're not really sure if it's done yet. <laughs> yes. That's a really good one actually, Heather, because um, I know when I was testing my first game, I thought that I was putting it in front of people when it was nearly finished, um, which is super cute. Looking back at that now, like I'm like, Oh, <laughs> oh dear sweet you, Ken, <laughs> you just didn't know. You didn't know. You thought you had finished that game and it was, not even really ready to put in front of people, honestly. Um, but I was sort of, I'd spent lots of money making the prototype all super great and everything, all the lessons I've learned. Um, and I think one of the things that I often say to people now is that it's 80% there, which means there's 100% of the work left to do. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Percentages <laughs> lie, right? So it, it's funny. Yeah. Like it takes it honestly, 95% of the work can be done. And, and for Tessa and I, as you know, developers know this intrinsically, it's like you could give me a 90 95% done game. It'll take me 95% of the time that you spent to get it to there. Or it'll, it'll take me like just to do the last 5%. Mm -hmm. Just to do that last 5%. It'll take me as much time as you did to get it there, if not more. Because uh, it's got nothing to do with the is. time, right? It's no. nothing to do with the time you spend on it. It's it's the percentage of the perceived finished game. That, and it's also the work that has to go into uh, like constant reiteration and testing of all combinations, right? So sometimes you get a design that isn't fully tested because how could you uh, mm -hmm. and then you're asked to develop new cards and new scenarios or new widgets and bits or characters or asymmetrical powers for it as the developer and you're like oh the system works until we did this now nothing works <laughs> but do you like that because if you like that we got to change all of this um, and sometimes <laughs> that happens and so it takes a long time but um we're not talking about development we're talking about feedback so in in feedback um, yeah, so we talked about framing is a really good way of doing it. One thing that I like to tell people, and I do this with my own students at school, um, you know, my intention when I give you feedback is not to break you down, it's to build you up. Uh, it's to help you reach that next point of, you know, of your journey in whatever way, shape or form it is. And so when you can take feedback as it always being constructive, whether it sounds constructive or not, uh, you won't get left with that, is this guy just a dick or is he being helpful? <laughs> uh, because sometimes, and you know, and it happens, like I might be, sh I am short, physically short, but I might be short with you in terms of my voice or my tone or something, de depending on what you're doing. Um, but I mean it in the most helpful of ways. And I think understanding the intention of the people that are trying to give you feedback, that are trying to give you this literal gift of a, a feedback is really important because then you can be forgiving of their, their personal uh, style, I guess is the word. <laughs> now, okay, that does not give everybody free license to be a dink because you shouldn't. But also, sometimes you just are, right? Cons run long. Heather and I have played at cons together where it's like, it's like two in the morning and yep. uh, we're all still here and you want me to give you feedback now? Are you sure? And you're like, yeah, give me feedback. It's like, okay, it's going to come out all wrong, but bleh, here you go. <laughs> and you have to be able to kind of roll with the contextual agreement that in this sacred space, I'm trying to help you. It might not sound helpful, but really, I'm trying to be helpful. Okay, so Kat, you had your hand up and saying with the I, butt I finger. do want to say, um, particularly one of the main reasons that I'm making a lot of noise about this is for um, people who are less commonly in these spaces, and sure. in particular, I mean women, but also just generally marginalized people. A lot of us have been conditioned throughout our lives to accept apologies and be polite and take whatever people give to us and be grateful. And I just want to be really clear that while I know that the intention of a lot of people giving feedback is to be positive, that doesn't give them a pass to be complete dicks about it. Exactly. So like, I, exactly. I get I get where you're coming from, but also like, we're not in any way saying it's okay if you're a dick to people. <laughs> no, so like, not try not to, try very yeah. hard not to. Yeah, not purposely. <clears throat> yeah. You might, I, I, I honestly, I know this because I was just talking to a student about this today. Uh, it's a place, it's a student that I see in clinical rotation. And <laughs> she was just saying, you know, <laughs> I heard from a lot of students that you were the mean professor. I go, oh, okay. <laughs> and she goes, but I don't believe, I, I, I never believed that. And after having me for my, my placement supervisor, I really don't believe it. I said, where, they, where did they get that? I said, well, okay. Cause I, I will tell you straight up. I'm pretty straight with the students. Like, okay, you are, you are cheating right now. You are cheating. This is a bad thing. Do not do this. Right. Um, whereas a lot of other people might not be that unblunt about it, soft about it, I guess. Um, because I think certain feedback needs to be listened to when there is that kind of dynamic. 
And I don't think we have that kind of dynamic around a game table. Mm. Student teacher, yes, we do. That's, I have control over their marks. That is my job. But feedback-wise, when we're equals, if I'm not the publisher, then we don't have that relationship, right? So that's, that's another really good well, point you've touched I, on, the, uh, the the feeling of being equal or not as the designer. I, I think this might be where you were about to go, Heather. All I was going to say is I think for, I, I want to say, I think for this conversation, we should pretend there's not a publisher at the table. Yes, uh, Because absolutely. that would, as a whole nother level, and I understand yes. that they're going to ask different questions. It could even be a you, ninth level. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh -oh. But, but yeah, you're, I think that just for the context of this conversation, it's just your getting feedback from other players, maybe other designers, but not a publisher, not a pitch per se, because yeah. that could take this to a whole nother conversation. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I think then that would be slightly different. So um, again, they should be giving feedback kind of in the same way, but there is a one little caveat difference there if we're adding publisher to the mix. Yeah. Well, one thing that um, quite a few new designers who are playtesting at the moment um, have said to me is that they often feel like there is a power imbalance between them and the playtesters and that they have to take whatever the playtesters have to say, no matter how uncomfortable and upsetting it is, because the playtesters have done them a favor of giving them this, this time. And so they have to, and they feel like they're in a position, a vulnerable position. And yes. um, that's part of what I'm saying about setting up your playtest because then you own the experience. It's yeah. like running a meeting. Yeah. The more you can frame it, the the better the outcomes will be. Mm. And about that power dynamic, there is there is a slight power dynamic because yes, somebody to give up two hours of their time for you, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you will hopefully pay them back at some time by giving them some of your time. But the fact of the matter feels like you do feel indebted to somebody who has given up their time for you. And so you feel like you should listen to them. And there, there's a real difference between like the content and the format, right? The content of a message versus the format of a message. Oh, so God. like, mm -hmm. you know, the delivery. Yes, exactly. Like how that's given to you is a very, they're separate things. And we talked last week about giving the the poop sandwich right the nice stuff the the bad stuff or the constructive stuff and then the nice stuff and that that was designed many many years ago thoughtfully designed to say okay we know that people react poorly so we're gonna couch that constructive feedback with a little bit of positive strokes on both sides right um, which is what I do not do with my students often, <laughs> to be honest, because they, they just need to hear the raw goods. It is, this is a raw deal. Stop cheating. Um, I like so, how you wrote this, but don't copy. <laughs> so for Tessa, when you're setting up a play test, because I've, I've tested, I've watched you play run quite a few play tests mm -hmm. and I've also been in um, a couple of your play tests as well, where you've been running them. Yeah. What is it that you do? Like, how how do you get yourself in the right place to run that play test? Is there anything you do in your mm. head beforehand? Is there anything you prepare yourself? Like, what what can what wisdom can you share about how you manage to be so chilled out when you're doing it? Yeah, um, I like to go into my play tests from a calm space, if ideally. Um, so usually, I've had some time beforehand to kind of. Um, get into my Zen, get things set up. I'll, I'll, I'll arrive at the table early if possible so that I can set up way before anybody would approach because that makes me super nervous whenever I'm like setting up the game and someone comes early and, you know, they're, they're patient. They're like, yeah, I can wait. But they're just like, I feel the pressure of like, I need to hurry up and set this up or I need to start a conversation other than us sitting in silence. Um, so it just stresses me out. So I try and get there early so that I'm in my Zen when I set up my game. And then I always make sure that I have something to take notes. Um, when I'm at conventions, usually I have my notebook, but when I'm like at, in a workplace, then I'll have my laptop because um, I keep like an online diary. So it's easier to refer to my notes. Um, and then uh, usually sometimes I like to play with uh, with players. Um, and sometimes I like to sit on the side. It depends on what exactly I'm testing for. Um, and like how many interactions are going on. Um, and do I need to, do I need them to play the game without, um, 
me teaching them directly or do I need to like kind of help them in because it's in such a rough state. So I decide whether or not I want to play. Um, and then um, I kind of just let things happen naturally. If something is going extremely off the rails, then I'll say, correction, this is actually how the rule is, or, you know, this is how it should play. But I, I often like to entertain what if scenarios. So if someone's playing something and they choose to do something differently, or they're just like, I'm interpreting the rule this way. And that's not how I intentioned. I'll just note, note that down. Like, they're choosing to play it this way and see what happens. Does it break the game? I don't know. Um, <laughs> and then at the end, um, I like to take a more uh, passive way of taking back feedback because my brain will concentrate on too many small details if I'm doing some sort of a back and forth with players. So I find it very useful to just write down what people are saying, um, regardless of tone, because you know my imposter syndrome, I can take tones entirely differently, um, and you know just based off of what's going on in my day, and um, I just. I find it more useful if I write the things down and then later when I've had time to once again kind of separate myself from the session and my emotions, um, I can read through it and say, you know, okay, they had a point. I just felt some type of way. Um, Cause there's always gonna be a point when someone gives feedback and you're gonna feel this little burn in your heart and you're just like, mm, but I already tested that or, you know, it didn't work. And, you know, if they're curious, if they invite the question, sure. But for the most part, they don't need to know that you tested this three times before. They don't need to be laughed at because, ha ha, I've already done this. Yeah. It doesn't work. You just, you can just write it down because they're yeah. taking the time to tell you. And, you know, <clears throat> if they're being a jerk, I move on to the next person. Um, but also I find it just interesting data wise to, write down everyone's reactions, whether it's their physical reactions or their verbal um, their verbal observations, because there are patterns. People work in patterns and for your games, it, it can help identify patterns. Like maybe they didn't say it in the right way. And maybe I argued with the logic of what they said, but they're still talking about the same issue, right? Yeah. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I approach mine is just always give myself the room and the space because at that time, I'm a person that will go into freeze response. Um, and so I know that about myself. So I just allow myself more so to focus on writing the notes, uh, zoning in on that, and then respond to it on my own when I can rant at the wall. <laughs> so <laughs> along, like from what you're saying, I think... The important thing that anyone can take from that is, first of all, know what you're like under pressure, mm -hmm. prepare in a way that's going to work for you, and take feedback in a way that you think you're going to be able to absorb. Does that sound right? Yep. Cool. Mm -hmm. What about you, Heather? Yeah, um, pretty similar. A um, couple different responses there, but like... Uh, also being prepared as far as the table, like having it all set because the hundred percent, the thing you're talking about, and this happens at a place like Unpub where you have a time slot and people start showing up kind of milling about. Um, I'm very talkative. So I, then they start talking or they know me or and next thing you know, I'm like forgetting to put a key piece out on the table. Right. I've done this before. So I try now to say, Hey, once I get this set up, you know, while we're waiting for the other people, I'll just kind of finally just say that now. But in the past, I would have the conversation or someone would be like showing me some picture on their phone. I'm like, hold on. No, we need to be focusing on this. So there was a little bit of distraction happening in, in my first few years of, of doing these play tests that I let happen that I realized was putting me in a state that later, if something was a little amiss, I, oh, this card was still in the box or I don't, there's six dice and there should be seven or whatever it was um, that I would get a little flustered. Like I wasn't prepared in front of everybody. Right. So um, who knows if they cared, but I would care. Right. And then that, you know, and that's then, all that matters. It's right? all that matters. If you're right? in the wrong place. If I feel like I'm not in the right place. Exactly. So making sure I have all the things. The other thing I do all the time now is I bring extra components of everything and blank cards because a lot of times somewhere okay. along the day, I'll be like, oh my God, we just need to add two more 
tokens and everything would be fixed or we need to make a card that says plus two, whatever it is, right? So um, I like to have that. Sometimes if the game's quick enough and we play it a second time like with the group, I will mm. try it with those new things in there right away. Just having that available has been very helpful as opposed to making a note, trying to find time to play test it later, never, you know, and then trying to remember what the context of that comment was. Um, so that's a big thing I do uh, if I can. Um, then the other thing, similar to what Fertessa says, um, writing all the notes down, except for instead of freeze mode, I'm defending talk mode. Uh, so then I'm talking about it with them. I'm, I'm justifying it for whatever reason, right? So not that we need to justify it to them necessarily, but you feel this way sometimes, we do. I think. You do. Like you feel yeah. like, well, this is why I did. This was my attention. I actually um, do know what I'm doing and I have right. to prove it to you, so, random so stranger. So being better about not doing that quite yeah. as much and not like you said for Tessa, don't explain that i've already tried that <laughs> six, six different ways and it never none of them worked just say clearly there's a problem with the scoring system and we don't know what it is yet not necessarily be listing out every version that we did um yeah. so so for sure that's something that i have also tried to do i still have a dialogue a little bit just because i can't not but just kind of taking it all down writing the notes and then leaving it at that as opposed to letting it kind of spiral and potentially into some bigger conversation or a fun. Yeah. That that's a good way of, of, of kind of nipping those little spiraling outs um, in the butt. And you can always like meet with those people later or talk uh, to them yeah, on email or, or whatever. Email me. Email. Here's my yeah. car or whatever. Yeah. Exactly. But uh, like there is a tendency. Yeah. yeah. And a tendency in that moment, like you said, while well, you've got them there, a captive audience yeah. and they're talking at you, you want to hear more ask them a question, do this X, Y, Z. But next thing you know, it's like, okay, now maybe we've spiraled down where they're now all redesigning my game, right? Yeah. That's happened. Mm. And you <laughs> lost lot. control, yeah. yeah. And then yeah. you lose control. <laughs> one of one of the things that I've learned from some of the worst playtests I've had, and also like meetings prior to that and so on, is that I have misinterpreted the way that someone was acting and thought, oh, this is someone who really does want to talk about this detail. And so I can talk about it a bit. And then they turn it into a big fight and you go ah, i shouldn't have opened the door mm. and that's yeah. one that um is an experience thing um but it's no matter how experienced you are you're still going to get caught by it i've watched it yeah. happen to other people and i've stepped into their playtest to sort of save them because you can hear the sound going up and up and you know sort of when i've when i've been like um it happened at one of the unpubs that i was at and i sort of just sat down like hi <laughs> what's going on and everything stopped which was fine, but um, I sometimes wish that people were there to step in for, for me that, that way as well. And I wonder if any of you have a technique that you can use when you see things are going off the rails. So you see that someone's getting worked up and you've set them off in the wrong direction and you don't know how to stop it. What do you do? I, oh, yeah. I, uh, I have a technique that I just use in life in general called the wall. Um, because a lot of people like to talk and they expect to go back and forth and that's what amps up that energy. But if you become a wall, you just kind of absorb oh. it. It has nowhere to go. It doesn't go back. And eventually they kind of stop and realize they're just talking at you, but they lose the wind. So for me, it's more like, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but that really peters down in, in my opinion, because usually that person is really getting into the debate part of it and the you know yeah. the theoretical devil devil's advocate sort of thing but if you are not giving them that same energy and you're not giving them anything to respond to then that shuts it down yeah there's a technique in customer service that's basically called the mountain and mm -hmm. what happens is they they sort of work themselves up a mountain and you just let them talk and they gradually wind down. And once you can hear them starting to wind down, then they, they start to be people again. <laughs> and so you can just, you can talk to them. But the trick in that one is to never apologize. And I was wondering if there was a similar one. And it sounds like your technique, even though it's not, you're not actually completely blocking them. You're just going, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm just going to let you get yep. this out of your system. Something else you could That's... do that might be, uh, if, 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 if you don't feel comfortable doing this or you don't feel comfortable telling them, hey, this is over or, or thank you. And you don't want to do that. Another thing I know a lot of people have done is bring someone with them who's not running the play test 
I think we have a visitor, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, bring someone with them who's either a design partner or friend that's mm-hmm. just there for like moral support, right? So yeah. mm-hmm. they can be there for many reasons. They could be like, I'll get you a drink. Um, I'm oh, taking notes. Uh, I'm taking yep. notes for you um, or you're taking notes and I'm playing in so that you can you want me to try a specific strategy, but then having, if, if possible, that person to be available to, to kind of jump in there for you or jump in, even just to say, I think we got to get to the next play test, not to necessarily mm-hmm. to have a debate. Um, because then a, wing, breaks, a wing person, a wing mm-hmm. person, it kind of breaks the between designer and, and, and this. Now it's another person involved and it's like, mm-hmm. Oh, maybe I should just go. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I, I think there's a lot of good if things you there. It. Yeah. And it, the thing is that in a lot of cases, right, it's because as Amy's saying, a lot of people get really nervous, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. when you're nervous, you're not as in control. So like right now, if I was running a play test, just fine. Like, okay, I've currently got COVID, so maybe not right now, but <laughs> just generally like my current mind state, I'm good. But by the time I've got myself all hyped up because I'm at a convention, there are people buzzing around. There's someone who's like, can I help you set up? Because I just want to get started. And you're just going, no, not right now. Yeah. Um, all of those pressures, they they make you even more nervous, right? So Amy is already going, oh, I'm showing my baby. And then mm-hmm. on top of that, you're not sure if you've presented your baby correctly or if, like, they're showing half their nappy or something because you haven't, you know, had time to get yeah. that baby that, that's a, that's a That's a diaper for I'm those sorry, of you who they're, aren't they're from the colonies. They're a diaper. <laughs> part of their diaper um but yeah you know what i mean like you're you're sort of you're already in this heightened situation and if you don't get to do that perfect setup or like what's happened to me at multiple conventions now you have a cue so you've got one group of people who are still giving feedback and the others are like well can we just sit at the table while you finish and it's like i mean i guess yeah, where, where, where the, the feedback's actually the big part, but sure, like just you know, shh, so, and mm-hmm, you feel this right. sort of. <laughs> so, it's yeah, having that extra person can make all that difference because the extra person can just be like, "Hey, I'll finish the feedback. You can do the teach, or vice versa, exactly." Or yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think you know, working with a co-designer or a partner or somebody who's like working with you on these, even if they're not part of the design team, is great. Um, a couple other things, just to just to uh give give my version of the butt finger <laughs> the butt finger is that what? uh the butt finger the butt finger oh. uh, so uh the <laughs> only time I have, uh, <laughs> that's not what i thought you meant i know, I know. <laughs> the only time i will i will not argue with a person because i don't really want to argue with a person about this or during feedback but i will say that i've done that already is if they've gone on for like minutes about it it's like oh uh, we've already explored that avenue thank you you know that kind of thing yeah uh or oh it sounds like that's something we've already done uh this thing we might not have done so maybe we'll go back look thanks and then we'll just kind of let's move on um a so lot what of do you do with is... the people who specifically go have you tested this have you done this how many times have you checked that how do you handle them oh how do i handle those guys mm. um i i i guess um i guess really my my answer to that would be asking them questions back about the game because that's what it's about it's like you're not here to test me on my on my game i'm you're here to tell me about your impressions of my game not ask me questions that i have to defend i'm not defending my game right um which is not what i say to them i don't say i wouldn't say that i would just repose a question to them um like if they yeah. ask me, like how many times have you played to this? Oh well, you know, lots. So tell me about what do you think about this? You know, I I would deflect. Yeah, and what I've done is again, and maybe uh, this is uh, more common to women. I don't know, but it's definitely happened to me. The same uh, cat with like a myriad of questions. Like clearly, you don't know what you're talking about. Is how it comes off. I'm not saying it is. It's sometimes. Oh no, it it is. It's just like it when you're wearing a band is, T-shirt and sometimes. they're like name three songs. But um. But what I will typically do, let's say it's a myriad of questions uh, or there's one or two questions or one question, I answer it. And then there's another question. I will typically give them a question. I'll give them an answer on one or two of them. I won't like shut them down right away. I'll just be like, oh, yeah, this is probably my 15th play test. Um, I haven't tried that new character thing that we talked about. Something like that. 
you know, but we're not, then I'll kind of say like, but we're not planning to release this game for X number of year, months, years, or we're still in the really early stages and we're exploring a lot of different things. Very vague, but something that's clearly like anything you say now after this, I'm just going to defer to that one vague answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if they do keep asking me, I'll say, well, like I said, you know, we're still, and then eventually kind of almost like the wall, they just go with the same answer, the same answer, the same answer. And they're, oh, okay. Got it. So. The reason I ask is because I've been in one of those situations where someone's been like, right, but have you tested this? And I've said, um, to a certain extent, but in an earlier version of the game. So in this version of the game, what we're looking at is this. So the deflect kind of redirect. And yeah, they've gone, deflect right, and, redirect but, is and straight back to, and so it's ended up being this sort of escalation of me going, let's talk about today's game and them going, <laughs> yeah. but I want to test you on this. And yeah, one of those situations, I was just like, hey, look, Thanks so much for your time. I need to move on to the next. Test. Yeah, and I think that is fair. Like, thank <laughs> yeah. you, thanks, about, thank you for your input. I, I need to hear from this person or this person or this person or this person, right? Um, because you can't let somebody dominate your feedback session. If there's four people and you have ten minutes, each person gets two point five minutes by yeah. law. By law. <laughs> Another question I have: I don't do this very well. I probably should do this more. Is a lot of people have feedback like sheets, paper sheets to give to people to fill yeah. out or a, a QR code to like a for Google form. But as you probably all know, uh, and maybe everyone listening has does not know this, people immediately want to say something when they're done. They, they don't want to just not, even if they're filling out that form or something else, they're going to want to say something to you probably. Um, so that could maybe quell some of these question after question after question but um i think you have to be, be prepared that people are definitely going to talk to you uh after, it'd be it, the minority of them would not talk to you most of them would so uh, unfortunately just bring a feedback sheet and if you're very if you don't want to hear the feedback unfortunately you're going to hear the feedback even if you hand them a sheet um so just for people yeah. who think oh this is how i can deflect and never hear this no that's not gonna no. happen. <laughs> they, they want they they want their they they and they deserve a little yeah. bit of their their time. Oh, yeah. the, their their time on the mic, their day in court, right? So. Yeah, it seems and, like a solution that would work. Oh, I'll make this form, and then they'll be able to think of it later and get back. That's not unfortunately. How that's it works. that's so, an extra. You also one thing I found really interesting because you brought it up is you get different feedback spoken and written. So oh, yeah, I do yeah. encourage both of those depending on where your game is at, but make yeah. sure you get both. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. like, even just the tiny thing that we did for Unpub at PAX West, where we just had a tiny wee form, and we asked them to, um, let's see, what was it? I stole it from um, the token con concept. So it was something like, um, should this game be published? Or, should, you know, like, I love this game, I want to buy it now, or I don't even think it should be published. This was horrible kind of scale. It was it was an exaggerated scale. Um, and then um, then how would you describe this to a friend, basically? Yeah, the how would something you describe along those lines. Quite That's cool. a great one, yeah. Like, there were, there were a couple of those sort of one to five scales and that. And so it was really, really short. And um, it was just, you know, circle two things and write a couple of sentences. And I heard them giving the, the spoken feedback because I could hear from the table. And then what they wrote was often different. Not bad, but just different. And you got different value from them sitting and really thinking about writing as opposed to speaking. Both were really good. Um, I don't know how valuable filling out an online form later is, though. Um, some people are going to do it. Some people are going to skip it. And the people who do it, I don't know whether they're still thinking about the game they played or the game they wish they'd played by that point. Right. Which may be valuable as well. In some Which shape. could mm. give, you'd have to yeah. take that with a grain of salt because yeah. you, or you'd have to say, true. is it, is, is the consistent thing from these 10 people, all that they thought it was awesome and they really like this one thing. Okay. It's doing its job from a marketing, what I could make this game in the world, but is it telling me what I need to fix? No. So, no. you know, it's, that's true. Um, something to think yeah. about. I just like, give them my card. If you think of anything else, email me. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think there's there's something about um, so so here here's a here's a I don't know. Don't tell anybody I do this, but <laughs> I, I don't listen to anybody's feedback ever. I'm kidding, I do, but not really. So here's the reason why, and the reason why is because a lot of people can't actually articulate what they think about a game unless they're a very good game designer, uh, and most people's playtesters aren't that. And so I don't actually, 
I do listen to the words that they're saying, but I I do what Heather's talking about. I'm filtering them into like threads, not specifics, but general threads about, oh, nine out of 10 people thought this was too powerful. Eight out of 10 people thought this was yeah. a decent part of the best part of the game. But they're actual literal words um, even though I do write them down, like Protessa said, because I believe everybody deserves to have, the, if they're saying the words, they have, they deserve to be written down. But from there, I'll collect the threads because the the thread to me is more indicative of the overall state of massive amount of game players versus one person's very specific way they said this thing, <laughs> uh, because they don't have necessarily the language to do that. Well, especially under pressure. Especially like you have five minutes to tell me everything you thought about this game that we just played for three hours. <laughs> Go. Um, it's it's not easy. And so and it's not say, I'm not saying that people who play games are inarticulate. It's just under pressure about something they've never experienced before. If they are not a seasoned play tester, it's really difficult to articulate. And so I watch, like you said, I watch body language because that's my area of expertise. And I think about how they behave in the game. I watch what they buy card wise or play card wise or whatever how they how they're responding to the incentivization patterns and the scoring patterns of the game um and I, what i'm listening for is how they felt that's what i care about is their feeling 100 yeah because the facts of the game are, are one thing and i can deal with the facts but i only feel one way about this game but if i pull a hundred people, I might get a hundred different feelings. More likely what I'll get is five or six threads of feelings, right? And that's what I'm trying to get out of their feedback. Uh, what feelings happened and what elicited those feelings and which are the best feelings and what are the bad feelings? How do I minimize the bad feelings? How do I maximize the positive feelings? Um, and a lot of that is by taking mechanics out or adding mechanics in or, or accentuating certain mechanics, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I, 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 I do, I do listen, I do listen, but I then consolidate that all down. Uh, I want to paraphrase something you just said, actually. Yeah. So, um, in, in terms of, well, actually paraphrase something I read in one of the groups in relation to what you just said. So they were saying the only thing that play testers are never wrong about is their feeling about something. Yeah. And I thought that was really interesting because a lot of playtesters will come up with like, they'll try and identify problems and they'll try and identify solutions and so on. None of those things are actually up to them. They can say what they felt weird about though. And that's where it's our job as the designer to find the problem and then develop a solution. But yeah. um, as a business analyst, so what I, I do in IT, um, my job is to try and figure out what people want in the end and how they want it to look and what they, you know, all of sort of the feeling side. And they try and they t and actually tell me the technical spec of it. I know that's wrong because they're front end users and they don't know that. They don't know any of that. So they think that they want a blue one. They don't want a blue one. They probably want a green one. But I'm just going to ask them, how does blue feel? It's the same right. thing. Like, yeah. what, what, does, what does this... How would it feel if I did this? Which things did you find felt really interesting? What what was the what was the vibe for you about this game? What which bits were frustrating? Where did you where did you feel really excited about something? What what was it like when you achieved this thing? Did it feel like ah, oh, or was it sort of like eh? Yeah, it's interesting because somebody else, Liberty Kiefer, was talking about uh, the the phrase "the customer is always right." Yes, that was another. Uh, and it's funny because the whole the whole quote is really the customer is always right in matters of taste. Exactly. And it's in matters of taste. And that's what I said. Yes, that's exactly right. And that does relate to game design and feedback because they are right in how they feel about the game. They don't like it or they like it. Yeah. But as to why, that's really kind of partly their job, but partly our job to figure out. And then it's our job entirely to fix it if we choose to. And that's the thing. She was saying that, you know, sometimes a game just isn't for somebody, but it's not, that doesn't mean the game is broken. If somebody doesn't like a game, it does not mean it's broken. does not mean it's not a good game. I despise, literally will not play a bunch of games that are very highly ranked because they're just not for me. They just don't give me the vibe or the kick that somebody else, that apparently 99,000 people <laughs> got out of it. I just don't get that out of it for whatever reason. I don't like it. Um, 
And, but I'm okay with that. I'm not going to go tell the designer of that game, hey, your game really sucks because... No, I'm going to go and give it a one ranking. Because, yeah, it's obviously right. it's ostensibly a good game. I just don't like it. So, for example, um, like Scythe. I am not a fan of Scythe. Yeah. Um, and I hear that from a lot of people. And part of it is because I was sold on giant robots doing things. And there are no giant robots doing anything in that game. They're giant robot miniatures, but they don't really do anything. That's giant robot-y. You know, like, like I can see, oh, that's a giant robot. Only a giant robot could do that thing. So that's why Scythe isn't the game that I thought it was. And so when, mm. and this is another thing I talk about with in terms of not feedback, in terms of like sell sheets, really. If you are trying to sell a game, Make sure that your promise yes. is the reality of your game, right? And we've had games that people passed on. We had this game. It was a good game. It was a trick-taking game about juggling cats. Um, and that's what we themed it. So you're juggling like chainsaws and cats. Isn't that hilarious? And somebody who's playing it is like, oh, like, we're done. After like two hands, it's like, oh, oh. Oh, and they said, no, it's probably a really good game, but... We, we thought it was about juggling cats, and it's really not. And so that's what we wanted. Oh, okay. And so we learned from that day that you have to have the promise match up with the experience. Yeah, and you you definitely learn that when you're playtesting because if you if people are just coming up and it's like, oh, it's a game about juggling cats, and then they sit down and you have e either not that negative, but maybe a negative reaction to the gameplay yeah. or whatever. It's like, oh, maybe it's not about juggling cats, or maybe we don't say it's a game about juggling yeah. cats. Maybe we'd say it's about um, doing uh, these big feats, and one of the things you can do is this or something. So you have to think about how you reframe it. And I've definitely had a lot of uh, help with that type of thing um from playtesting because i'll have like well this is how i'm gonna say is what it is this is what it is and then after three or four more months it's like oh no now i say this um that's yeah. why i ask my question every single time how would you describe this to a friend very quickly it gets me past that stage of oh okay i'm describing it wrong because i've got like you know, every single playtester has told me how they describe it. And I'm like, ah, I see. Okay. Ah, They're yeah. actually seeing this game. That's not what I thought. And so very quickly, I've got all of that information and I just store it. One of the things everyone has said, except for me, is they write things down. If I write something down, it's gone. Oh, wow. It's completely <laughs> gone. And so what I do is I take photos or I do, or I sketch things. And yeah, I take then every lot. time, every time I look at the photo, or even more, like all my university notes are drawings, like generally, yeah. the, um, particularly from the art papers. And I can actually still look at those and go, "Oh yeah, right, okay, Tomb of the Augurs, five fifty BCE. Yeah, I remember that." Yeah, I do. I do sketch notes a lot too, not while I'm taking feedback, but yeah. Um, recording video is really yeah. good if, if people will let you. That's yes, good. so uh, good. Jim Baker is saying, I feel forms are great only in certain situations. Back to forms. Agree, they have agree. to be short, simple, and in order to get actual significance in the data, you need a lot of them filled up. This is true. Yep. Uh, if you ever study data, you need numbers. That's and the other thing. Yeah. It has yeah, to be a, a well-constructed survey. Otherwise, it's a pointless survey. So Yeah, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. And like you should understand how to do surveys and how to use Likert scales and all those things we've talked about before. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Jim would like to know this from our guests. How do you handle a play test that overshoots your target time frame for Tessa? Yeah. How do you do that? Um, so I tried my best to set an expectation. Um, hopefully, if you've, if you've tested your game a bit, you can kind of get an average of how long it takes per player count. Um, nice. and, a, and depending on like what slot I'm in or um, how much time I have, I will either try and cut off the game at like the first phase or the first round or second round um, so that it's done within a reasonable amount of time. I can still get the data that I need um, and then have time for feedback because having a super long game that wasn't promoted as a super long game um, can be really detrimental to getting good feedback or at least feedback that isn't coming from like people who are just very irate and hangry. <laughs> um, so uh, setting that expectation helps. And then also if I see that it's running long, then I may say, hey, uh, we're kind of getting close to time. So I'm going to give everybody one or two more turns around 
and then we'll end it on this person's turn and go to feedback. Yeah. And they're perfectly okay with that. Yep. And if somebody isn't, then they'll be like, I'll come back from another game. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's cool. If they, if they yeah. liked it that much. Awesome. What do you do, Heather? Um, I mean, exactly the same thing. I, I already plan in almost every play test that is in the public. I should say, not at my house, um, at a convention is I almost always plan if it's a longer game that I'm not going to play the whole game. Probably going to get three quarters of the way through is what I plan on a longer game, meaning like over an hour, hour and a half. I don't make three hour games, so I'll have to worry about that. Um, but then um, from my, putting my Unpub hat on of what I've seen of a lot of designers who have longer games and they've had the same issue where they only have a two or four hour time slot and they can't even get one full game in in two hours let alone you know more than one in, in a four make hour slot games people so yeah that so just make shorter games now but so um what we've said is you know you don't have to show the whole game so if you think about it in uh phases or whatever it might be it's like we're going to do we're going to preset the game up like the game is already set to like turn three maybe yes and then you we're going to start you here you you typically wouldn't have this. You'd only start with three resources, but we're starting you with seven, whatever it is. Um, Take a you, slice. Yeah. You would probably need to, to do your own playtest enough to know what that turn three looks like or turn five, but maybe then what you're trying to test is either the mid range or the end of the game. You'll actually get there in that case. Yeah. Yeah. So in the case of it not being a long game, in the case of it being a game that has been made long by the playtest, <laughs> um, and we we all know we know exactly what I'm talking about, right? This is a game that normally plays in 20 minutes, and you've been there for an hour and a half. What the hell is going on? Um, what do you do, for Tessa? If question. you can feel that that's starting to happen, how do you manage that? I mean, for me, if I see that things are getting elongated. So I like to keep detailed notes, even before it's the feedback session. Think of it as like a, a play script where it's just like, this person exited stage left. I will write <laughs> like what people are doing. This little kid punched her brother um, at this point. And to me, I find that just as fascinating and interesting. It's still information and data that I can use because if the game is taking longer, it's still to me a study of how people are interacting with my game and how they'll do it when I'm not around. Um, and if it's not, I still will notate like, okay, this person took a bathroom break at this time and they came back at this time, or this person went to eat dinner. Cause sometimes like if I was watching a recorded play test per se, I, or I'm doing something with friends, then it could be like, oh, pizza came at this time. And so it just elongated by a whole hour um and for those cases again it depends on if you know them if i know them i just let it happen naturally and come to its conclusion and if it's in the con itself then i again will try to cut it out cut it off towards the end at a more natural point um if i see that it's taking up too much time uh, but if it's like a group that knows each other and they're just kidding around then i just let them know hey we're coming to this time um how do you guys feel? And I go from there. Um, but it, it's more about reading, reading the room and seeing if it if it's being long because they're like having a good time and they're socializing, or is it being long because there are like too many distractions or um, you know things that maybe I could help on my game end, or maybe they're just not in the game at that moment. So it, yeah. The main reason this happens in my experience rather than those reasons is that someone has decided they want to give feedback all the way through or those sorts of things. So generally, if I see that happening more than a couple of times, I say, hey, um, I'm really interested in this information you have to give me. It's great that you're pointing it out, but it's also important for me to know how long this game takes to play. So um, if you wouldn't mind, I'll give you a piece of paper and a pen. If we could talk about this at the end, that would be awesome. So that's, that's one of the other ways I do yeah. it. Um, Heather, what, what do you think of? The other thing I, I do that, uh, or I've seen too, is uh, it, let's say it's not because they're distracted or because they're uh, talking. It's because their analysis paralysis. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's, it, it could be my thing. It's too confusing. There's too many options. It could be they don't understand it and they're afraid to ask, what does this mean? And they're trying to 
read everything and analyze everything. I mean, that's definitely something that I've seen happen on many play tests that I've been playing in or my own game. Um, and what I'll try to do is if it's analysis paralysis, especially if it's like, okay, the first few rounds is going to be that. And maybe they'll ask more questions. And then we're now in around like four or five and there's still something happening. Um, you know, basically at that point I will kind of come in and be like, Oh, um, do you have a question about yeah. what to do on your turn or something like that? Or, um, uh, you know, remember that this <laughs> phase means that the black or worth double, whatever it might be that I'm thinking that they're forgetting, um, and they, uh, to try to do that. And then at least sometimes that will break them out and be like, Oh no, I'm just trying to decide, if I should spend my seven resources all on this one big splashy thing or buy these three other things. And I'm like, Oh, okay, gotcha. And, and kind of break them out of it. Um, but that is tough, especially on a game that has a lot of decisions because you want to allow people to take the time, but you cannot have that be the final game because clearly there's going to be, it's okay, going to take way too long, yeah. especially if it's noted as a 30 or 40 or 50 minute game and you're at an hour and a half and you're only halfway through and everyone's questioning everything. You want to let it play out, but it's also like, yeah. yeah so I try this to is... like little nudge feedback and questions. Yeah. Sorry. This is also an opportunity to um, test any player guides you've got and add player guides if you're spotting that there's a um, yep. some way people are getting stuck too. Um, I noticed that um, just given that we're almost at seven now, Ammon's question here, I think we've sort of covered this. Um, I don't ask what was the most fun or what did you like the least because I find that guided questions like that often don't get me the feedback I want. Um, I tend to just let people talk and then I will ask them <coughs> a couple of very specific things about the game and then I ask my standard, how would you talk about it to a friend? Um, what do you guys do? Sen, what do you do? I have a magic question. You want to know my magic question? It's this. Uh, if you were to play this game again and it changed even like 5% for the better, what would have changed? That's it. That's a good, good question. Yeah. Because yeah. they, I can't expect to change it to like 100% better. But I, really all I'm asking you with, the, with that question is, what would make this game better for you? Even just a mm. little bit better such that, you know, and I forced you to play it again and you played it again and you liked it just a little bit better. What would have to behaviorally change in what you did or what the game asked you to do. And for a lot of people, it's like, oh, you know, they, they think about it for a while. They're like, oh, you know what? It would have been shorter. <laughs> a lot of times that's what it is. Uh, yeah. Sometimes it's like, oh, you know what? I, you know, I wish we could have done combat more because, you you know, you sold it as a combat game, but there really wasn't that much combat, you know, that kind of thing. So oftentimes it's, you know, did your promise meet up with your the expectations yeah. and the delivery of it? And then other times it's just, you know, what did that person want more of? is is usually what you're getting at and when you have 20 30 40 50 people telling you that same thing maybe you ought to focus on that right so i like things where you can get a very simple answer that we can then put into a thread of you know yes here's what people said they want more of for tessa yep for me so whenever i get to the end of a session i one like to set the expectation of how i want to get the feedback, receive the feedback. So I say, hey, I want to go one person by one person so I'm not overwhelmed. So please let each person speak until they're done and then we'll move on to the next one rather than going question by question for everyone. Um, and I like to open it up first with a very general, like, what are your thoughts? Um, mm -hmm. Unguided, what is the top of your mind? And then after I've gotten everyone's like, unguided what's at the top of their mind i will ask the three questions of what was the thing that you liked most about the game what was the thing you like least about the game and is there one thing that you would change what what, what would it be and those are usually pretty uh, again straight to the point like sin was saying um because i find that it's sometimes hard for people to verbalize those things they either because they don't want to hurt feelings or because they can't quite put their finger on it. Um, but if you frame things as like most and least rather than did you like this or what did you hate or things like that, um, it makes it a little bit easier to approach. 
And um, it also really simplifies it. And if they struggle to answer that, that in itself is an answer. Yes. And just jot that down. Um, and they're like, oh, there's nothing I can change. That's fine too. Um, but I, I find like, having more detailed questions than that aren't so much useful unless I am playtesting with other designers or experienced playtesters um, because they, uh, those are like usually mechanical questions. And what I'm trying to get from people or the playtesters are just like the normal populace who would be purchasing the game and just open it. Normally a family, they get a game, they're not gonna be thinking about how the mechanics went or the balance of the numbers or the, the catch up mechanism just wasn't sufficiently refined in the game. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's not what they're thinking. Exactly. They're thinking, so, can I smash my brother? Yeah. That's what they're thinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how about you, Heather? Oh, sorry. Had you finished, Fertesa? Oh. Yeah, yeah. That yeah, was pretty cool. Much it. Pretty much covered almost all, all the things. The only things I would say, and, and basically you were starting to say that the end is if I'm closer to the end, in quotes, of my process, if I'm working on like scoring a specific character or a specific thing, I might specifically ask that question. Um, but I usually start out with the more generic, get the, get the initial like, uh, we have to tell you this. Uh, and then if it's early on, like if it's a new design, I, I really don't, like he said, ask other than like, what was your favorite part or something like that? Um, what would you change? Something like that. If I'm much further along, I might even say, you know, we just added these characters before you didn't have a specific character. Uh, what do you think about that? Or we just added this to be a five player game from a four player game. So how did you guys feel the time was? So I might ask those questions, um, but I kind of lead them into why I'm doing it. So if it isn't a game designer, they can be like, oh no, it felt fine. Or actually it did feel a little bit long. We're like, okay, you know, they're, they're giving me something there. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's that's pretty much all the stuff that I do as well. Um, certainly what Fertessa was saying is I tend to let people run them, like run out as far as they need to unless they're taking up everyone's time and sucking all sure. the air out of the room kind of thing, in which case I tend to just be like, hey, yo, you've been talking for 20 minutes straight. Like, can we let someone else have a go? Um, actually, being on this show has helped me with that a lot. Like, oh, Heather hasn't spoken for a minute. Let's give Heather a moment. So that's been really, it's good training. Yeah. You should be a GM. It trains you really well. Oh, man. I don't know. Spotlighting I, I is, is really an important thing. <laughs> I, I haven't even played a, a whole RPG of any sort yet. I no. think GMing it would probably be a bit of a big step. Heather, you, you better you better get her started with like... Yeah, I bought, I I bought the purple really one. What's yeah, the purple you did, one called? Uh, women are werewolves. You got that hey! one. There's no GM, though. <laughs> no, but also that is an award-winning game, let me tell you. Yes. I came to get it because I remembered that. And I was yes. like, I know it's purple. <laughs> Oh, that is purple? <laughs> Not that it won an award? No, no. I, it won an award and it's a purple one. I have to find the purple one. Nice. That's as far as I could go because names good, good. are hard. Yeah. Congratulations, by the way. Thanks. That was awesome. Yes. <laughs> Big congratulations. Uh, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to tell Yunsu for a long time and I, I just I just couldn't. So it's awesome. Um, hey, we are over an hour and I got to get back to marking. So it's time to go. I'm sorry. But thanks so much to everybody who's here as a guest for Tessa. Uh, remind me to email you later. Heather, it was great seeing you. Kat, always good seeing you. Uh, Jim, Ammon, uh, George, Amy, also good to see all of you. Um, if you want to talk to us more, you can find us on social media. I am at Senfeng Lim on Twitter and Blue Sky. Not yet all the things, mostly because I don't understand Instagram. Um, <laughs> do you want me to put you on there, Sin? Do you want me no, to help I you have it, I have an Instagram account. I just don't use it. So there you go. Or, I mean, if I use it, it's for mostly like jujitsu stuff. So I don't know. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Kat, where are you? I'm at Dreyer Inc. on all the things. And Meeple Syrup on all the things as well. Mostly thanks to Kat, because I don't interact with like half those channels. Yeah, it's uh, mainly me you're talking to on those things. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, for Tessa, where are you? Uh, I am at Fertessa usually, and if not, it's at Fertessa something. Just put mm -hmm. Fertessa. There's only one Ferdy out there. Yeah. Everybody, only one Ferdy. Yeah. <laughs> and exactly. then uh, Heather is mostly at ninth level games on all the things, right? Correct, correct. Yeah. 
because I've tried to find you at Heather O'Neill on some things and it's just not I right have anymore. a few but I'm mostly uh I'm doing so much for the business and then I might as well just do that might as well just see everything from there right? yeah <laughs> you, you run the do, you're the unpub on Facebook uh, uh I do the Facebook uh other people do the Twitter but it's the it's the unpub on Twitter which or x whatever it is now and uh Facebook just on the unpub group or unpub yeah yeah so interesting. Yeah. Um, if you want to uh, reach out to us and maybe help support the show, we're at patreon.com slash people syrup. And hey, can we get some final advice about receiving feedback from Heather and for Tessa? We'll start with for Tessa. What's your final yeah. advice on receiving feedback? Final advice on receiving feedback is receiving feedback is an actual skill that you have to practice. I thankfully, I went to art school, so I got a lot of practice getting critiques, but receiving critiques and being able to iterate off of that is something that it's a muscle you have to exercise. So one, I recommend play testing as many games as possible and then taking the perspective of how you would feel in the reverse so that yeah. you could kind of um, replicate that whenever you have your own sessions. Yeah. And then two, just have as many playtest sessions as you can, practicing the things that you want to do well, um, and hopefully eventually get there. Reflect on later what you did that maybe you you regret you you had done, like may maybe you responded back when you didn't want to, or uh, you know <laughs> maybe you weren't quite as prepared as you wanted to be. All of that is practice, and it's a skill, just like drawing, just like many things. So just keep doing it. And repetition to get better so so you you get because you went to art school you get the mean professor uh, yes. idea because it's it's funny because when i did the auto critique i don't mm -hmm. know if you guys saw my auto critique feedback thingy um <laughs> my comment to a lot of people is like i guess you never went to art school because if you went to <laughs> art school you would know what it feels like to get ripped down like yeah. every single project you hand in because yes. it feels like that but the intention of the professor is yeah. not to do that and you have to understand that mm -hmm. to get through art school doesn't again give license for those people to mm -hmm. be mean about it. That auto critique mm -hmm. felt like any anything just critical like I, about I, it. I went, I have a BA. Um, all yeah. of my writing had exactly mm -hmm. that applied across it, and it was super yeah. good. It was very useful yeah. and didn't it's, feel it was, mean. It was, it was it's just, just very weird. That, that's yeah. Anyway, uh, what anyway, art school did you go to? I yeah. didn't know. Oh, sorry. sorry, I. Just, I uh, Oh, cool, cool, cool. University okay. of Florida Fine Arts. Okay, sorry, Heather, go. Yeah. No, you're yeah. good. Um, yeah, the only other thing I was going to say, and um, this is, you know, this is also a learned skill is to be confident in your design. Yeah. Um, it's really hard to do that, especially when you're new to this. Um, Back but um, I, I'm, I'm talking specifically to the feedback session when they're giving you feedback to be confident in your design then and to not say, oh yeah, sorry, I should change that. Oh no, uh, you're right. I did make that mistake. That doesn't work. Uh, yes. Those kind of comments that show weakness, um, then there's might be them thinking you don't know what you're doing and then more is piling on. So um, better to not say those things and to be confident or keep your mouth shut so that you, you, you know, you're getting the feedback the other way. Uh, I've definitely overheard and seen things happen like that. Um, taking too much from the playtesters and either immediately saying, saying, yes, I'm going to change that right now or apologizing for it not being a, a good experience. So don't, try not to do that. It's hard. That's a great point. Yeah. yeah. You can do those things with strength, but it's a completely different thing. Yeah. 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 Very, awesome. very good advice. Excellent. And next week there is nothing. Haha. <laughs> because we're on break. <laughs> uh, so Kat and I are going to be on break for three to four weeks. It's going to be, it's going to be a long one. Meeple syrup people, uh, meeple people, uh, meeps is usually what we call you, uh, just because we've got things to do and families to go visit and holidays and all that kind of stuff. So we'll see you in three, if not four weeks, uh, because the new semester starts for me and I need to be a mean professor. That's <laughs> what I need to do. All right. So thank you very much to everybody who came and watched the show live. If you're watching on the replay, hopefully we'll we'll get to chat with you about that. But thank you again for Tessa and Heather for coming. And we'll see everybody in 2024. See you later and, and happy holidays. Yeah. Oh, just before um before yeah. we completely close out, um, we will be working on next year's schedule. So if you have ideas for people you want to see, if you yourself want to be on the show, any of those things, hit us up at Maple Syrup on all the things. Let us know what you want to see. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah. All right. And we'll see you all later. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. All right.
All right.